Welcome back to our final installment. I'm Nina. And I'm David. Today we're going to be talking about fiduciary duties. That's right. Now David, before we go any further, what are fiduciary duties and who has them? Fiduciary duties come to the world of trust law from the world of corporate law. Corporations created a position called a director to act as an intermediary between the owners and the managers of the corporation. The directors represent the interests of the owners by overseeing the actions of the managers. The directors have a fiduciary duty towards the owners of the corporation. That's the basis of a board of directors. Well, that's a director, but what about a trustee? If an organization was created by a trust, then the people who oversee it are called trustees. If it's a charitable corporation, then it's a board of directors. They both fulfill the same governance role towards the organization. So there's really little difference between a director and a trustee because they both have fiduciary duties. That's right. Now, if the director of a regular corporation owes a duty to its owners, who does the director of a charitable organization owe its duties to? They owe their duties to the recipients of their services. That, in general, is going to be some portion of the public at large. Okay, but if the director of a regular corporation breaches its duties to its owners, the owners can vote them out. How does that work in a charitable organization? The Attorney General's office can bring an action on behalf of the public in a court of law to enforce fiduciary duties and to protect charitable assets. The only direct power the public has is where they put their donations. Okay, so a director or a trustee owes a fiduciary duty to the public at large. Let's get into the details. What are these duties? There are two main duties, the duty of care and the duty of loyalty. Care and loyalty. So what's the duty of care? The duty of care is actually the easier standard to satisfy. The test is that of an ordinary and prudent man. What does that mean? Well, a court is simply asking if the decision would be made by an ordinary person. Basically, this means you have to act rationally. A board should be prudent in its decision making. So what's an example of a breach of the duty of care? Well, signing a blank check, for example, or if a board were to hire somebody to manage its investments, that had a criminal record of defrauding investors, things a board would be irresponsible to do. So the duty of care is really just extreme violations, but what about purchasing stock from a company right before a collapse? Is that a breach of the duty of care? Well, courts generally don't want to second guess business decisions. The key to satisfying the duty of care is process. A board's decisions should be deliberate and follow a process. Okay, so that's the duty of care, but what about the duty of loyalty? The duty of loyalty actually has more everyday implications for a board. The duty of loyalty is that a fiduciary should put the corporation's interests ahead of their own. That sounds pretty straightforward. Well, in New Hampshire, you actually see the duty of loyalty mostly in the area of conflicts of interest. That's where a fiduciary's interests are not aligned with the corporation. In New Hampshire, the conflict of interest laws are outlined in the statute. The first statute on conflicts of interest is that there can never be a loan from an organization to anyone with a fiduciary duty to the organization. The second statute outlines that each organization must adopt an annual conflict of interest policy. The last statute focuses on the amount of dollars of business between the fiduciary and the organization. As you can see, the statute is very detailed. It spends a lot of time defining terms like fiduciary, benefit, and organization. If you are not sure whether or not it applies to you, please contact a lawyer or the director of charitable trusts. So what does the statute mean for what I can and cannot do? The statute in New Hampshire is actually unique. It says that conflicts of interest are actually broken down into three levels of business totaled over the year. The first is under $500 in business, the second is between $500 and $5,000 in business, and the third is more than $5,000 in business. So what does this first level mean, under $500? This one's actually pretty easy. If there's less than $500 in business between the fiduciary and the organization, the law says that there's no conflict of interest. All they have to do is keep track of it and make sure that it doesn't go over $500. What if it does go over $500? Well, that makes it more difficult. Now the law says that there's a conflict of interest and three things must happen. The first requirement is that there must be full disclosure of the material facts of the transaction to the governing board and the attorney general. Second, the person with the conflict of interest cannot participate in the discussions and must recuse themselves from the vote. Third, the board must record in the minutes why it chose the action it did. Recuse? It just means that they can't vote on that particular issue. The final requirement is that the transaction must be approved by two-thirds of the voting members. 
That level sounds fairly strict. What's the over $5,000 requirement that's even tougher than that? If there is more than $5,000 in business in the year, then everything in the $500 to $5,000 level applies, but there is one additional requirement that the organization must publish a legal notice in a local newspaper. Okay, just so I can remember all of this. If the organization does over $5,000 in business with a person, then they must disclose to the Attorney General's office and the board. They must recuse themselves. The board must publish in its minutes why it made its decision. They must publish it in a local newspaper, and it must pass with a two-thirds vote. That's everything. Can you walk me through an example? Sure. So let's say we've got a little league team that needs a sponsor. So they go to Joe, who owns Joe's Sporting Goods. Good old Joe. <laughs> So Joe agrees to be made sponsor and he's put on the board. Now the team needs shirts, so Joe offers to sell them 25 shirts for $15 each. How much is that? $375. So under $500. Exactly. So Joe can sell them the shirts without a problem. The team doesn't have to disclose anything and Joe doesn't have to recuse himself. But later, the board decides they want to buy the kids hats for $10 each. So they go back to Joe. So. Now that the total annual business is over $500 with Joe, they must comply with the law. So the transaction must be disclosed to the board and the attorney general. Joe can't participate in the talks on who to buy the hats from, and he definitely can't vote on the issue. Plus, now that the business for the year is over $500, Joe also has to report the shirt sales whenever he reports all conflict of interest transaction to the AG's office. So the law requires that he has to disclose the sale of the shirts now. Exactly. So, the team has a wonderful year and they make it to the Little League World Series. Donations come in and the board decides they want to buy the kids matching uniforms. They're going to cost $200 each. Shoes, gloves, the works. Back to Joe's. This transaction, at $5,000 alone, plus the earlier sales, puts them well over $5,000 for the year. Under the conflict of interest laws, Joe still can't vote, the board must disclose everything, the board must record in its minutes why it's making the decision that it is, and now the board must publish a legal notice in a paper indicating that they're doing more than $5,000 in business with Joe and Joe's sporting goods. And that's it? That's it. So is there anything else our watchers should know about conflicts of interest? Just remember that you can make no loans to officers or directors, that each organization must adopt an annual conflict of interest policy, and that you should keep track of the dollar amounts of business so you can comply with the law. Well, that sounds like a lot of things for the board to remember. Thanks for going into all that detail, David. Thanks for listening. Well, that just about wraps it up here at the Charitable Trust Unit. Thanks for watching.